Welcome everybody along to the um, RPS Scotland uh, latest talk. We've had a number of these over the last year and a half. Um, we're doing them roughly every six weeks or so. And it all started as a result of the of the, the COVID and, and not being able to get face-to-face -face meetings. And they've been very popular and very successful and we'll continue to keep on doing them. Uh, we'll have more coming on this year. We've got another couple coming up this year and then we'll do more for next year as well. Tonight's talk is given by David Collier, FRPS. David is currently the documentary photographer of the year and I had the privilege of, of taking his prints up uh, along with the other ones up to Inverness to the uh, the Eden Court Theatre which we, we, we hosted the first Scottish um, section of the documentary photography of the year exhibition. It then went down to Shambelly House, and uh, not Shambelly House, to Chateau Haro House down in Central Belt. So we had it in Scotland for two months altogether, which was excellent. Uh, and it was very well received. All the photographs were wonderful. And David's obviously stood out beautifully. So we thought we'd ask David to give us a talk tonight and give us a bit of background about himself and about where he's come from and what the what his, his previous photography and what his current photography is all about. The um, so David, I'll, I'll pass on to you. You can you've got your screen share on, uh -huh. and you can start chatting away and entertain us. Okay. Not with a guitar tonight, but no, I'm not going to play guitar. Want, if you want to later on, you can. Yeah. That was that was especially for the Thames Valley branch. Was okay. <laughs> OK, well, look, um, I'm, I'm David and thank you very much, everyone who's uh, who's turned up to, to listen to me sort of ramble on for an hour or so. Um, so I'll say sort of from the outset, I'm not the type of person that sort of writes a script and works from a script. So, you know, most of the things I say tonight will be uh, sort of fairly stream of consciousness and sort of prompted by the photos that I'm going to show you. Um, so I... I, I guess as a photographer, I, I sort of came to the public notice a couple of years ago when uh, the work that I, um, I shot in the hospital where I work um, was on the front page of The Guardian, had a double page spread in The Guardian and, and, and sort of went around the world and, and, I, and I subsequently did a book about it. So if we just sort of start from the very front page here. So this is an anaesthetist and uh, an operating department practitioner or an anaesthetic practitioner um, getting ready to go into theatre during the first wave of COVID um, to perform an emergency operation. Now, I, um, I'm i an operating department practitioner myself. Whenever anyone asks me what I do, I always say I'm a photographer who just happens to have the bills paid by the NHS. Um, so I do the job that the person on the right hand side is doing. So if, ever, if any of you have ever had an operation and, and I suspect that, that, you know, a significant proportion of you will have, if you've had a general anaesthetic or if you've had a spinal anaesthetic, I'm the person that works with the anaesthetist. So I, you know, I always describe myself as being the Robin to their Batman or, you know, the Debbie McGee to their Paul Daniels. I make sure that everything goes well and I manage the, um, manage the anaesthetic environment. Um, and, and I've worked in that environment for a long time, but I started off life in, in a very, very different way. So we go, kind of go back to the beginning and, and talk about my journey as a photographer. It started off like this. So I am the son of a journalist and a nurse. Um, you know, and the nursing is, is pertinent to my healthcare role. But I grew up in um, newsrooms and newspaper dark rooms. First of all, as a child in New Zealand, and then when we came back to England in the um, in the late seventies in uh, in Paul in Dorset, and then in Surrey, and my dad started off as a, um, a sports journalist, um, and then he became in the, the latter part of his career he was the editor of the Surrey Advertiser, um, which was owned by the Guardian Group. And at the end of his career, he was the editorial director of forty of the Guardian's titles. But I spent an awful lot of my childhood just hanging out in a newspaper environment, and I absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, every film that you've ever seen about classic journalism where, you know, smoke-filled rooms, men and women clacking away on typewriters with green visors and, you know, their sleeves rolled up and huge piles of paper on spikes. That's exactly what my childhood was like. I spent an awful lot of time making my own newspapers i used to get the little blocks that the printers would um would have and, and make my own newspapers and, and you know this was the days when nothing was digitalized you know everything was still on microfiche but every newsroom had boxes and boxes and boxes of black and white photographs that had been taken over the decades and i just used to i was in heaven because i just used to sort of work my way through through you know all of these and 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 just have a fantastic time so i got to hang out with the journalists i got to 
write little bits for the newspaper. So I was writing for newspapers in my teens. Um, but more importantly, as a photographer, I also got to hang out with the um, the press snappers, and and so I used to go out and shoot stories, shoot local interest stories to them. There was a local, there was the um, uh, the Tyrrell Formula One team were were um, were based very nearby, so we used to go and see them a lot. We used to go to Brands Hatch and watch the Grand Prix, and I just had a you know a, a fantastic time. It was kind of an idyllic childhood, really. And you know, I mean, I, I learned so much just from hanging out with the press photographers. You know, and as a as a 13, 14 year old kid. Just, you know, going out on jobs with them, going to the local pub, you know, learning how to buy a pint when you're 14 years old, all, you know, all the, all the things that you couldn't get away with now. But, you know, back in back in the early 80s, you could. It was great. So I so I decided that I wanted to be a photojournalist. I wanted to be able to take photos and I also wanted to be able to write as well. Um, and to do that, I needed a camera. And all I had at the time was a pretty crappy little 110 camera that my grandmother had given me. Um, I had a couple of friends at school who had SLRs, so I decided I needed an SLR. And there was a, um, a camera shop in a local town called Lloyd and Keyworths. And in the window, they had a Zenit E. And, you know, most of us here have probably had a Zenit E at one point. You know, it's kind of the, the Volvo, old Volvo estate of the camera world. And it was forty nine ninety nine from memory. And that was a lot of money for me in those days. So I had a paper round and I put uh little leaflets through the the doors of all of the houses on my paper round saying that I, I was available for doing odd jobs and I was trying to save up to buy a camera and within a week or two I'd earned enough money to buy this camera and a few rolls of film as well and I've still got the camera somewhere in a, in a drawer that's actually there um and I went out and I just took lots and lots and lots of photos and I took lots and lots and lots of really really rubbish photos and I spent years trying to be something that I wasn't I spent a long time trying to be an artistic photographer and I spent you know a great deal of time lying on my belly in the garden taking shallow depth of field photographs of flowers and things which was not what I was at all really I was much more interested in being a human life photographer and the first photo that I ever took which I thought, and sadly I haven't got it to show you, it's somewhere in an album in my parents' attic. First photo I ever took, which I thought, actually, do you know what, this is a good photo, was my grandfather after Christmas lunch. Now, on my mum's side of the family, um, we come from a Romany gypsy background, and my grandfather was this incredibly hard, ex-bare knuckle fighter with gold teeth and, and gold rings, always flashily dressed, and he was asleep in the chair having had one too many sherries and he was back in the chair with his mouth wide open snoring wearing a paper christmas cracker crown and that was the first time i ever took a photo where i thought actually you know this is this is a reasonable photo so i kind of developed my style from there and just sort of went on and uh, and i sort of dipped in and out of photography and, and when i got to the end of sixth form college um my dad sat me down and he said look we need to have a talk about your career because the nature of this this job is changing. So when my dad left grammar school, having not worked very hard with one O level, he was able to get a job on the local newspaper as a cub reporter. And he worked his way up to, you know, to the top. But he said the problem with the trades then, and this was, you know, this was this was back in the uh, in the mid 80s. He said, there's an awful lot of people coming into it who come from very wealthy families and you don't come from a very wealthy family they can afford to be an intern on a paper for a couple of years and work free of charge um, and build their career that way. You can't afford to do that. So you're always going to be coming up against these people who are snapping at your heels and able to do it for cheaper. And I would suggest that you go out and find something else to do for a living. Um, and I took his advice, which was very unusual because I didn't normally take my parents' advice about anything, uh, you know, as my kids don't do with me. You know, that's, that's the nature of being a uh, recalcitrant teenager, I guess. But I did. And I went off and, and I went and worked in the antiques trade for years and years. I was a restorer. But I always worked as a um, as a photographer on the side. I had dark room in, in the corner of my workshop and I had my own business for 18 years. And then in 2008, the, the credit crunch and the recession came. And I got out and I went back to university as a mature student. And that's how I ended up working in the NHS. I went and did my degree and, and did that. But again, I, I was always a photographer. I always worked as a photographer on side. I did a few commissions. I did jobs for people. Um, and that's what really drove me. And then a few years ago, I, you know, I started climbing, climbing the career ladder in the NHS and I hit 50 and I thought, what do I want from life? You know, I can I can carry on climbing this greasy career pole 
or I can actually do something for myself that I really enjoy. And my partner lived in Abergavenny in South Wales, where I live now. I was in Bristol at the time. And a job came up in the hospital here. So I went from, so I took that, I took a downgrade. I went from working in a massive major trauma hospital to working in a small district general hospital, much, much nicer environment. And I thought, I'm going to concentrate on being a photographer. And it turned out to be a really, really fortuitous move because actually if I hadn't done that, then I wouldn't have been in a position to to photograph the, um, the COVID work that, that I became well known for. So if we go on to the next slide here. So... I had thought about doing a documentary piece about the hospital that, we were, that I work in because they built a big new hospital locally. And I thought, you know, photographing the last couple of years of this DGH working as it has done for the last 40 years will be good. And then COVID came and I thought, actually, do you know what? There's a story here that's, that, that really needs to be told. So I went to my manager and said, look, I think this would be a really good photographic project. What do you think? Can I do it? And he went, I've got no problem with that at all. Run it past the communications team, run it past you know higher level management and see what they say. And I expected to be told, no, this is ridiculous. You can't do that. You need to get on with your job. And, and actually they were really forward thinking and they turned around and they went, yep, no problem at all. You can shoot whatever you want. Um, you don't need to run it past us to vet, but anything that you do put out and publish, um, we would like you just to show us, just so that we can cover your backside if, if you know anyone complains or it goes wrong. And it was really refreshing to actually have that level of trust. And you know, they knew I was a photographer, they knew I was a, a, a clinician. Um, and so the two the two worlds came together really. So I started photographing what I was seeing on a daily basis in the hospital. And like an awful lot of people who work in the NHS, and I know there's there's a couple here tonight, we were getting very, very fed up with the whole NHS heroes rhetoric. Um, because at the end of the day, from, from our perspective, we went to work, we did the job that we were paid for, we're all highly trained professionals. Um, there were elements of what we were dealing with that, you know, were terrifying to put it, bluntly but we've all been in terrifying situations before um so i did a body of work and i decided that i was going to call it all in a day's work because it's a slightly glib title but for many of us that that's that's what it was all about and i had um about five years ago i went back to shooting film i, I decided that i was um you know i was spending too long looking at the back of a camera and not in front which for a documentary photographer is you know it, it's fatal really you know you need to be sort of look, just concentrating on what's what's in front and what's unfolding in front of you all the time so i went back shooting film and and when this project came along i thought you know what it would make sense to shoot it digitally but then i thought no i'm going to be true to to my practice and carry on shooting films so you know i had romantic notions of wandering around with a, a light meter and uh, you know my my Leica m3 you know pretending i was robert kappa photographing what was going on but of course that's totally impractical and i had bought one of these little olympuses a little olympus xa3 that many of you may remember from the 80s fits in the palm of your hands point and shoot it's got three settings on it it fitted on a lanyard around my neck and in my scrubs i could wipe it clean because i could close it and it was absolutely perfect for the job so i i, I used that and i shot it on a mixture of um kodak triax and an ilford hp5 and i was coming home you know every couple of nights and, and processing the um the films that i'd shot and, and scanning them and went from there so if, if, what i'll do is i'll take you through some of the photos that i took and just sort of explain a bit behind them so what you're looking at there is is the cover of the book that I did it's called All in a Day's Work. And it was that book which actually um, got me the FRPS as well. Um, so to begin with, before COVID actually arrived on these shores, there was an awful lot of preparation that had to be done. So, you know, we were all getting used to the PPE, what PPE we could actually get. But one of the critical things that we all had to wear was something called FFP3 masks, which are masks which give you a higher degree of protection than a standard surgical mask. And what you can see happening here is um, two of my colleagues um, and the one on the on the right is the tester. And so you put your, your head in this big hood, um, like a beekeeper's hood almost, and into that hood was were sprayed noxious smelling and tasting chemicals, which were completely harmless, but just unpleasant. Um, and as soon as 
you could taste those, what would happen then would you would put a mask on and the chemicals would be sprayed in again and you had to be able to wear the mask for 15 minutes without tasting the chemicals um, or smelling the chemicals. Um, and that was to give us a, a decent level of protection against COVID. Um, so any, you know, any, any time we were doing anything where we were in contact with COVID, we would have to wear these um, FFP3 masks here. So you can see that Jo on the left, who is, is a nurse, you know, she's already got that sort of look of trepidation on her face because there was a lot of the fear of COVID, particularly during the first wave, was we just didn't know what we were dealing with at all. We didn't, we didn't know what was, uh, you know, how it was going to manifest, what it was, what it was going to be like when it arrived. We, you know, we'd seen on the television what was happening in in Italy, so you know there was a degree of fear around it. But there was an awful lot as well of jocularity and hilarity, and you know anyone who works in this environment who says that they aren't in it for the adrenaline, you know, fueling moments is probably being slightly disingenuous. But also there was an awful lot of boredom as well. There was a lot of downtime. So, you know, because because what had happened is we had cancelled all of the elective work that we were doing and only doing emergency work or ITU work. Um, you know, whereas we would in this hospital, we would be running six, seven theatres on a daily basis. We had shut it down to only two theatres running, plus the maternity theatre. Um, so a lot of the lists that we would normally be doing weren't happening. So there were, there were a lot of staff sitting around. So, the, you know, there was to begin with for the first few weeks, there was a lot of sitting in offices. And here you can see a couple of anaesthetists just um, you know, showing showing themselves something on, on their phones. So here's a, a moment of uh, let me just get rid of that so I can see it. So what you're seeing here is um, lying down is Carl. Now, Carl is a, um, a simulation mannequin who costs around about £70,000, I think he is. He costs an awful lot of money. Um, and he's computer controlled. It's absolutely uncanny. He, he looks like a real person. And what, what's even more alarming about Carl is that he looks like a dead version of me. Um, and, and the very first time I saw Carl was I was wandering down the corridor and, and one of my colleagues, one of the anaesthetists was in uh, in one of the anaesthetic rooms and Carl was laid out on a trolley. And I took a look at Carl and I thought, Carl really doesn't look like he's long for this world. And Ed, the anaesthetist, is looking incredibly calm, just doing something on his iPad. And Carl's got absolutely no monitoring on him whatsoever. So I went in and said, Ed, do you need a hand? Do you need to get some monitoring on this guy? And he went, no, no, it's fine. And I went, it's not fine. Look at him. He's... And he went, oh, have you not seen him before? And I looked at him and, and it's weird because he looks and he feels like a real person. And, you know, he's, he, he looks like a middle aged bloke. He's got stray hair sticking out of his nose and out of his ears. And, and you know, you lift off the blanket and, he, and he's anatomically all there. And, and correct. He's, it's just really, really bizarre. So so he was used for a lot of the um, a lot of the simulation practice. So here you've got Linda, who's one of the. Um, the, the theatre assistants who was uh, getting to grips with Carl, so to speak. Now, Neville Hall, where I work and where I still work now, is um, is a very small hospital. So I've spent most of my career in the NHS working in very, very big hospitals where you are effectively a number. Um, but I was always told, and, and my partner worked in, in Neville Hall for a long time, she, she's a cardiology specialist, um, that Neville Hall had a real family atmosphere to it. And, and if I wanted a job there, don't expect to get one within a couple of years, you know, for at least a couple of years, because it really is dead man's shoes. Nobody wants to leave there. And so when I arrived, I was made to feel like a member of the family from, from day one. Um, you know, I, be I became known as English Die because you know every every David in Wales is called Die, um, and so what you've got here is is there's no real hierarchy in 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 the theatre environment. So Sadie, who is fairly newly qualified, one of my colleagues on the left, and Graham, who is a as a consultant and ethicist on on the right. So those two have known each other more or less since they were kids because they grew up. Sadie's mum used to work at the hospital. So, you know, Graham was a was a baby doctor when when Sadie was a kid. So unlike a lot of hospitals where the consultants have nothing to do with the nurses or nothing to do with the porters in a hospital like this, 
everyone works together and plays together. So, you know, we all live and work in a small town or in the towns around here. We go to the pub together. We go out partying together. And it's just a really, really good atmosphere. And, and what that enabled me to do was to get this series of incredibly intimate photos of people you know it was almost like being i was part of the team obviously i'm part of the team so it was like it was like being a sort of an embedded photojournalist in in a, in a war situation and because i chose to shoot on that small camera it wasn't obtrusive at all so you know everyone knows i'm a photographer at work so so that hurdle was broached straight away they all know me because i'm a colleague and a friend and because i use something really small that basically they didn't even see me taking photos a lot of the time and obviously this one's posed so this is different um i got very very candid and very very intimate shots if i'd used an slr or if i'd used something where i was actually having to focus it or i'd used a dslr people act very very differently when you put a camera in their face so so the beauty of the way i shot this project and and being part of the team as well is that i got the type of photos that nobody else was able to get and and to begin with nobody was really able to get in and shoot covid anyway in this country because there just wasn't the trust there from hospitals to allow photographers in but subsequently when people did go in and photograph what was happening and stuff it was it was done from a very detached perspective and everything became slightly whimsical there were lots and lots of photos in sort of muted color tones of people looking you know with thousand yard stairs looking out out of windows and to my even the stuff that Rankin did you know I thought everything look the same whereas with this stuff i can look back at it now and i think i'm, I'm really sort of proud of what i shot and it, and it it's like looking it is it is like looking at my friends really but but i managed to sort of record something fairly momentous at the same time so and that if you, if you look at the caption on the left hand side that kind of says what i've just said but there was an awful lot of you know there's there's an awful lot of good banter and good japes and 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 I, and I always say anyone who works in this type of environment needs a strong stomach and a dark sense of humor and and here you can see so pete on the right who is one of my colleagues who like me is from south london similar sort of age but uh, he's ex-military and ex-cid and Gemma on the left who uh, does a bit of beautician work in her spare time and and she decided that uh, I think Peter just had a shower having done a case and uh, she decided that he was suffering from middle age eyebrow syndrome and and just and that she was going to give him a trim and sort his eyebrows out so uh, so I just thought that was that was a nice tender moment to shoot and here you've got another another couple of colleagues who we, we had these photos put up uh, showing the correct way to to put on and take off PPE and and one of our managers who uh, is now retired but he was actually from he's a, he's an ex commando from Dumfries I think, and uh, there was a picture of him uh, in in an apron and and so they were drawing devil's horns and and comedy breasts on him um, and a moustache I think and uh, and there he is he's found his uh, found the found the photo oh, they drew a bikini on him that's what they did i think but uh, these photos look incredibly grainy actually in, in real life they don't they don't look quite as grainy as that but, uh, but you know he's, he was a good sport he was, he was a good laugh so and you know every, everything was taken taken you know in the nature it was intended really so i said i was interviewed for a for a paper and uh i drew this analogy of what it was like to actually work in the time of covid and uh and I said it was like a tsunami because we, you know, it was almost like you're standing on the shore and we're getting to this point where you know it's coming, you know, the sea's gone out, you know it's going to come back in again, but you don't know when, you don't know what it's going to be like when it arrives. You know, we'd all seen what was happening around the world, particularly in Italy. So we knew that potentially we were facing an incredibly complex and incredibly challenging um, clinical situation. And it got to the point where after, you know, after a couple of weeks of preparation, what's known as preparation fatigue sets in. So at first, everyone's having a laugh. You know, you've got that adrenaline rush. Um, you're really looking forward to something happening. And then you start to feel anonymous because you're wrapped up in this PPE all the time. You start to feel like a part of your identity has been taken away from you. And people you know people begin to lose their tempers and snap at each other it's human nature you know what what you know what 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 seems like fun at first suddenly becomes a real bind and it got to the point where we weren't allowed to go home so if you were on call normally if you're on call you can if, as long as you live within half an hour of the hospital 
then that's fine you can go home but we were actually having to sleep on the premises so there was constantly uh, an emergency team for intubation for putting people into ITU there and, and I was part of that intubation team and so people people are beginning to get fed up and and you know you're just waiting for this this huge event to happen and of course you know when it did happen it really did happen and so what we've got here is, um, so this was a photograph taken in an operating theatre during an operation. And you will notice that there is one key ingredient missing from this, and that's the patient. And I decided very early on, you know, right from the outset, really, that um, I was not going to photograph any patients at all. Um, what I was really interested in was turning the camera back on ourselves as a group of uh, practitioners, nurses, doctors, theatre assistants, porters, and showing who we were as real people. So moving away from, you know, the NHS staff that were being eulogised every Thursday night by, by neighbours clapping um, and just showing what we actually did and as people. And the reason I didn't photograph patients is... For me, it was an ethical step too far. I think if, if I'd been a photographer working for an agency or working for a publication and going into another hospital, I would have photographed patients um, because that story did need to be told. But when you are using your clinical position to gain access to patients who, in many cases, even though they say yes, are not really in a position to give informed consent because they don't know where they're going to be, even if they are going to be alive in a, in a week's time. And they've got this terror in their eyes because everyone who was put on a ventilator knew the statistics that you had a 50 percent chance of not coming off a ventilator again. For me, that was a step too far. It didn't it didn't sit well with me as a healthcare professional, as a photographer. You know, it, it, it makes for a good story. But primarily, I was still a healthcare professional. I was still having to carry out my clinical duties. And so I chose not to put any patients in this story uh, and really to leave to leave that element of of, of the whole narrative Im implicit rather than explicit. I mean, so so what we've got here on the left hand side is a consultant anaesthetist um, and she's wearing a you can just about make out she's got one of those very, very shiny visors. Um, which were crazy. I don't know whether any of you wore visors, in, visors instead of masks. Crazy to wear because it got to the point where actually you forgot you were wearing them. You couldn't see. They were so crystal clear. And I became the laughing stock of theatres once when I ate a banana or tried to eat a banana without taking my visor off and stuffed it into the front of it. So, but in the middle, we have got um, a guy called Mr. Sri Kumar or Kumar, as he's known. And he's he's a surgeon, hated the visors big DIY fan and he went out and bought himself from B&Q some of these um, these um, eye protecting goggles to go over his glasses um, and so I just thought you know it's, it's quite nice because it's almost a little bit Heath Robinson you know we because PPE was in, in short supply as well pe people was kind of making up their own you know equipment and making it up as they go along really and another one of the things about working in a small hospital and working in the family unit so kumar's wife was um uh, an anaesthetist she was a, a consultant anaesthetist who i was working with on the day she died she had a brain hemorrhage in in theater um literally the last thing she said to me was suck it up buttercup and she we were making a joke and then and i turned around and she was gone she she turned, and you know so i'm working i'm working with this demographic of people who we've been through an awful lot together this is the only photo I took, and I don't regret it at all, um, that had complaints made about it. And it had complaints made about it because when people saw it, they thought it was a patient. Um, and I guess, you know, if you don't have anatomical knowledge or you didn't know it was a mannequin, um, then you could be forgiven for thinking it is a patient. It would, it would be a patient in a very, very unfortunate way if their legs were doing that. Um, so in the book, there was a disclaimer every time Carl appeared in, in the book. Um, it had to be made clear that he was a mannequin. Um, do you know what's really interesting about this photo is for the first time ever, I've noticed that underneath the trolley at the end, there is a perspex head of another mannequin with a endotracheal breathing tube in its mouth. Never noticed that before at all. 
Um, so yeah, so this is so what's going on here is um, is these, these are the recovery staff and they're and they're they're training on the new airway equipment that uh, that we had to use. So all of the airway equipment that we had to use, um, you know, we had to be incredibly adept with it because it was all done in you know hermetically sealed areas and it, and if there was a break in the circuit it was it added another 20 minutes onto the time that we uh, we had to stay in there in a locked room with it so we wanted to make sure that we were doing it right and you know that was one of the things actually about being on the intubation team the first few times that you actually um were, were tubing patients to put them on a ventilator you're so hot and you're so claustrophobic and you have that you know that that sort of fear coming over you because nobody you know nobody nobody knew at the time you know if you breathe this stuff in was it going to kill you you know were you were you going to come out of it? and of course it did kill an awful lot of people jake on the right another consultant and ethicist um Gemma in the background chief eyebrow trimmer of the trust um so jake i used to work with in bristol but when he was a uh, when he was a baby doctor and i was um, i was already qualified uh, i was there when his uh, his first child was born and uh, and it was a pretty terrifying birth as well um, so we've been through uh, through quite a lot together and then we ended up working in a little hospital in wales together as well so andy in the background australian consultants just um just retired and he was one of the people so he he's not being tested for a mask here but andy is about six foot five six foot six um and incredibly slim he's you know overall he's about the size of you know the girth of one of my legs um and uh, because he's a slightly slightly peculiar shape normal masks um ffp3 masks don't fit him so every time he went into a clinical environment he had to wear this hood um which is sealed and it has a pipe coming out the back of it um, with a clean air exchange unit on on his belt behind him yeah. i always used to make the joke to patients that he was so tall that his head was uh, out of the atmosphere so he had to wear a space suit this was taken at about three o'clock in the morning. Um, so this was in the third overspill area. So this was the day surgery unit, which had been turned into a, an ITU. A couple of members of staff, a uh, guy on the left, Steve, does the same job as me. And then Adrian on the right is an anaesthetist and uh, he's just about to go home. This is um, at the end of every day, uh, we had a, a team debriefing. And the manager on the, the left hand side, who is now retired, um, didn't have an awful lot of respect from from many people. And you can see that she's not really captivating the audience there. And uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the problem in the NHS uh, and any business really is you get people put into management positions who don't necessarily have the um, the clinical experience, and we all felt that at the time. I mean, yeah, you know, she's lovely, and she's she's come back working at a, at a basic level now, and she's and she's very very good. But what I find very interesting about this is that nobody's wearing masks, and you know we were still back in the um the sort of fairly early stages of covid here where it wasn't known how it was passed on and you know so we were going around every day cleaning things down with act claw which is a type of bleach and you know people at home were being told to put their um their mail into um into a box and not touch it for for um you know for 72 hours but of course actually covid is spread through the air through aerosols sort of generated particles from your lungs and we're all walking around with um, with no masks on. So you can see why so many people and, you know, several thousand NHS staff succumb to it. And, you know, we've we've got people that we work with who who lost relatives. One of my colleagues' husband died. And uh, you know, most, most of my Indian colleagues have lost um, several family members and, and friends back in India. And uh, I, li I like the fact that uh, Linda, who was... Uh, one of the most cynical members of staff every every time i photographed her she sat in a wheelchair uh so this is um another practitioner anesthetic practitioner and a consultant getting ready to go into itu for the first time and uh, getting to grips because we we don't put gloves on an awful lot not 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 sterile gloves and gowns so you know getting to grips with double gloving and in some cases triple gloving and uh, and so you can see that now people are beginning to get peed off and fed up and the looks on people's faces uh, beginning to betray what was really happening 
uh, another um, another surgery happening, and another surgeon uh, or another another colleague on the left hand side. This, this is the funny thing about healthcare: is uh, we work with an awful lot of people who pass through our lives quite quickly, and and in many cases, you know their face, but you don't know their name. And I can't remember this guy's name. He was he was Egyptian, and and again, he was huge. He was about six foot five, and he was just known as Lurch like Lurch from the Adams family, because he just used to sort of bumble around the corridors. Um, but I was there for the birth of his um, first child as well. So I feel like I should be the godparent to a, to a lot of my child, a lot of my colleagues' children. Now, this is the photo that really kind of changed my, uh, changed my life as a photographer. Um, I said this the other day when I spoke. So this, this is kind of my, uh, my, my Don McCullen GI photograph so if any of you know the photograph that Don McCullen took of uh, of the shell shock GI just looking straight at the camera um so this is this is Sarah and Sarah's an anesthetic practitioner and she'd only just qualified six months before Covid struck so you know whereas you've got a lot of uh, a lot of old dogs like me who've been around the block several times you know it was tough enough for us but for a lot of these junior members of staff this is what they cut their teeth on clinically, you know, so was, you know, where, whereas my clinical teeth were, were cut on doing sort of lumps and bumps in, and, you know, before I, before I moved on to the sort of really big stuff, these people were thrown into a pandemic, you know, right from the outset. And this was taken at eight o'clock in the morning um, and just at the beginning of a shift. And Sarah is still knackered from the day before. And she's got that thousand yard stare on and she's just, you know, she's just looking into space. And, and I walked in and saw this and I just clicked off this photo. Um, so the story around this photo is... I had started, I, so I live in, a, in a, a street in South Wales, which is a typical, I don't live in the valleys, but it's typical sort of valleys, housing, terraced, Victorian terraced housing, no front gardens, straight on, doors open straight onto the pavement, and then the road. Um, and I had started photographing my neighbours, because I thought, what am I going to photograph? I can't get out, you know, we're all having to, to lock down. You know, I normally go out and work on projects around the place. And so I kind of looked at what was happening with um, social distancing. And it's a, it's a kind of nominal two metres from the front door to the pavement. And so, again, I put leaflets through through people's doors um, and said, look, I'm a photographer. I, um, I live in the street. I want to do this project. And quite a few of them, you know, I think about 70 odd percent of the people in the street agreed to be photographed. And I've got a friend who lives close by who is a journalist. Um, and uh, she does a, she's done quite a bit of work for the Guardian and, and the Observer. And she said, "Why don't you give the Guardian, um, the the, um, the locals editor, somebody called Caroline Ballantyne, a ring and tell her what you're doing with this project, with the with the um, the social distancing project?" And so I did, and Caroline was really really interested. Um, and she said, "Yeah, we're going to print it." And then I didn't hear anything more, and it kind of went by the by. And then of course, every other photographer in the country has the same idea, and I, I actually got. Um, got contacted by a photojournalism a documentary photography student in South Wales um, accusing me of stealing her idea and and I said to her look as a photographer if you think you've had an original idea you're either very very naive or you're incredibly lucky I said the, the thing about a project like this is everyone's going to be doing it because it's one of the obvious things to do you know photographing people through their windows photographing people on the front doorstep so it never got published in the Guardian but I mentioned to them that I was photographing in the hospital um, and they bit my hand off for the work, uh, you know, to a degree, you know, I knew I had a story, but to a degree where I was surprised at just how much um, they wanted the work because I didn't know at that time that no other photographers were able to get into 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 um, hospitals because, you know, I, I was existing in such a bubble really you know in, in terms of the work i was having to do um so the guardian said you know how many photos have you got and i said oh i've got i've got loads i said i'll send you some so how many do you want they said well can you send us about 20 photographs so i did send them 20 odd photographs and they said do you want us to send a journalist out to interview you or do you want to write something for you yourself now i can write it's one of the other things that i do you know i grew up writing i still write for magazines and occasionally for newspapers now and also having grown up in a newspaper environment i was savvy enough to know that if i write it myself they're going to pay me more and i'd already had 
um, you know, I'd already sent stuff off off to to a publisher for the for the book to to come out, and I'd already written an essay for the book about what it was like going through COVID. So I submitted that to the Guardian, and they loved it, and they said we will put it um, we'll put it online. It will be one of, it will be our photo essay in in a few days time. And I thought, great, it's really good. And you know, they they paid me a reasonable amount of money for it, and. Um, I what happened then and nothing happened actually I didn't hear anything for about a week and I thought uh, you know the story's probably been spiked you know it's probably been you know in old-fashioned newspaper parlance that you know the copy's probably been put on a spike something else has come along something something better has come along some uh, you know one of one of their own photographers has been into hospital and taken photographs so I just kind of didn't think anything more of it really um and then the notifications on my phone went off one breakfast time as I was sitting just before work and uh, and it said COVID in a rural hospital. So I clicked onto it and there was my story. So they, they in Guardian Online, they had, um, they'd run with the whole thing. They'd run with everything that I'd written and all of the photographs that I had, um, I put in, I'd, I'd submitted to them. I thought it was great. You know, it's exciting. There's nothing like seeing, seeing your work, you know, being, being published by, you know, something like the Guardian, you know, one of the big, biggest papers in the world, you know, even if it is just online, you know, it, it, it's really good. You know, as, you know, as a photographer shooting a news story, getting, getting your work out there is great. So I thought, well, I wonder if they put anything in print because they, I'd said to them, will you put anything in print? And they said, well, we'll try, but it's really difficult getting stuff in print at the moment because there's just, you know, there's so much competition. Um, so I cycled into work um and halfway to work is a garage called bailey's garage and i thought i'll go and pick up a copy of the guardian and see if i've you know see if i've made one column inch on page 27 and i cycled up to the newsstand and i looked down and there was my photo uh, on the front page of the guardian and i shouted something very loudly starting with f and almost fell off my bike in shock uh and then i picked up the guardian and uh, thought, oh, just have a look inside and see if they they put anything else in it. And on pages four and five, I had a double page spread. So all the photos that I'd submitted and all of my writing um, was there. So I had three pages in the Guardian, and uh, and the front front of the Guardian. I mean, I, I've now got framed. It's in my it's in my hallway. Um, and it was just it's just surreal it, it felt very very surreal for a long time and, and i and i i bought every copy of the guardian that the uh that the, the garage had which bearing in mind i live in through blue monmouthshire in wales where you could put a blue rosette on a monkey and uh, and it would get voted in with not that many copies um but i bought them all and i cycled into work and, and i showed my colleagues and and i said look we're in the guardian you know we're on the front page and I'm really proud because actually that is most people have never heard of ODPs, or operating department practitioners. We, we always joke that we're like the SAS, you know, nurses of the infantry and we're the SAS. You, there's a lot of secrecy about them. So Sarah was the first ODP to ever appear on the front page of a, uh, a, a national newspaper, certainly, and I think a newspaper as well in a clinical role. So so that got an awful lot of publicity from the College of Operating Department Practitioners. And um and Peter Dench, who many of you will know, the photojournalist who writes for Amateur Photographer, made that his um, his photograph of the year and interviewed me about it. And uh, and he, when he interviewed me, he said, where are you going to go from here? What are you going to do? And, and, and I just made this joke and I said, I'm just going to surf the 15 minutes of minor photographic celebrity and uh, and then I'll get back on with shooting the same stuff that I've been shooting for the last 30 years. And he went, no, he said, you won't. He said, people will still be talking about this work in 50 years time because you're the only person that's ever managed to shoot it because nobody else could get in. He said, we're all completely jealous. So I had people like Tom Stoddard messaging me, you know, to congratulate me and retweeting my work. And then I was chosen by Peter to be one of the prince of four principal photographers at Photo North in Manchester last year. And my work was on the wall next to Tom Stoddard's, you know, sadly he just, just died. Um, and so it really was surreal. And I, and I got into work and I, and I phoned my dad. I was still in the car park at work, parking my bike. And I phoned him up and, uh, and you know, I said to him, and the first thing he said was, oh, I saw, I saw your work in, in the Guardian online. Really good. Excellent well done and i said yeah and i got the front page as well he went oh of the abergavenny chronicle that's brilliant that's so good well done and i went no i got the front page of the guardian and i could kind of hear him spitting his cornflakes out and he just said to me do you realize what you've done and i said no not really 
what do you mean? He went, well, you put the biggest news story in the world on the front of one of the biggest newspapers in the world. And you're not even a full time photographer. And, you know, most most photographers will never do that in their career. And it kind of then it began to sink in. And, you know, two and a half years down the line and I'm talking to you guys about it. And there's probably not a day goes by where I don't field questions about it or get approached to talk about it. And, you know, I'm already booking talks for, for next year for camera clubs to to talk about it as well. So so it's been it's been incredibly good to me. Um, my son's a photojournalism degree student in um, in LCC in London. And, uh, you know, he, he came home one day and uh, or he phoned me up and said, oh, God, they mentioned you in my uh, one of my lectures again. And I get to lecture on his course now, which is quite surreal for both of us, really. So, so, so yeah, so it's, it's 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 been it's been very kind to me this this work. Uh, so on the left is me, um, and I had been in PPE for about six hours at that point, and you know, literally, I'm kind of melting in a pool of sweat on the uh, on the floor. But the, you know, I wanted to be in the project myself, and the beauty of using the camera that I did was I was just able to hand it over to a colleague and say, right pointed at me frame it like this and and photograph me and similar on the right hand side i think i think that was taken during the same operation and you know we, we all just chatted and you know we were very uh or, you know you, you can't drink for five or six hours because you can't get out of theater and you know pee the color of coca-cola we were all really sort of worried about our kidneys and what it was doing to our health taken at about three o'clock in the morning again this was the third itu overspill area um, and we're moving anaesthetic machines out of theatres where they're not being used to put them into an overspill ITU um, so that we can ventilate patients on them. And we had so many patients coming through ITU um, that we were having to work out the logistics of running two breathing circuits off each single anaesthetic machine so that we could ventilate two patients on one machine. Uh, just another colleague. Uh, so clean areas and dirty areas. So basically outside in the anaesthetic room or outside of theatre was a clean area and then somebody inside in, in, in theatre, which was the dirty area. And I think here they were, we were showing a drug calculation through um, through the window. I've got a photograph which didn't actually make the book, but it has it's subsequently done quite well of one of the anaesthetists on the other side of the glass window. Um, laughing and i'm actually the hand in the photo and what i'm doing is uh i've been upstairs to the canteen and uh, because he can't get out i've got a bacon and egg bat and i'm holding it out and i'm taking the photo so i'm i'm, I'm taunting him with my breakfast because i know that he's not going to be able to get out for about three or four hours so that, that's kind of the, the sense of humor that we have in uh, in theaters so the photo on the left didn't make it into the first edition of the book. It made it into the subsequent second and third editions. Um, so this is Lauren. Lauren is a nurse who had, again, only qualified about six months previously. Um, and this was up at the end of a 12 hour shift and, and we were restocking theatres. And this is a box that surgical gowns come in. Um, and she climbed into the box and just joked and said, I'm so tired that I could uh, I could sleep here. Um, and the photo that made it into the book, you can actually see her face, her, her hands are raised and you can see her face. Um, but this one is, uh, this is my favourite. And, and I don't know why I didn't put it in. I think it's because it was rushed out as a news story. But I love the way that her hands are framed in the flap of the box. And she's got these incredibly elegant, long fingers, almost like a concert pianist. Um, and my mum was a nurse. And, uh, and she said that for her, this photograph just took her right back to what it was like being so tired at the end of a shift. So, uh, so yeah, that's a, I've sold quite a few copies of that. Um, again, just a, another um, another sort of surgical scene on the right hand side. Jeremy, ex marine, didn't want me to take his photograph. Didn't want to be in the book, um, but once he did go in the book. I was was quite happy to be in it but uh, you know this is a guy who's worked all around the world clinically and as a marine as well so he's he's as hard as nails and uh, you can see the, the the strain etched on his face on the left going into ITU uh, on the right Linda in the wheelchair again 
nobody in that photo on the right has uh, a uh, a face on that they would be happy to be photographed and portrayed as but there you go and uh, again this is this just kind of shows who we are as a team really and uh, i always joke to these two that it reminds me of a couple of chimpanzees grooming each other so this was after wendy had had a shower you know after a, after an infected case and is just having her hair um hair washed and so again it, it, you know, her hair combed and plaited after having washed it so it just shows a team bonding really and i think you know that that that's the one thing that I, I wanted people to take away from this project was the humanity rather than the drama this one always reminds me of a sort of carry on scene with uh, jess pulling her gloves on the doctor will see you now now this is my personal favorite um and so this is this is laurie um and laurie is obviously uh celebrating her 40th birthday at work um i never work on my birthday i think life's too short um but laurie had and laurie is an incredible woman she um tragic you know absolutely tragically um lost her six-year-old daughter about six years ago um to a horrendous type of um, childhood cancer called neuroblastoma um and um it's just kind of a mark of the you know the type of person that laurie is really that you know that she overcame that 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 tragedy but also that she comes into work on her 40th birthday to you know to put other people first but but the, the success of this photo and the fact that it's gone everywhere um, has helped Laurie to actually open up a bit more about what she went through with her daughter. Now, I, I myself was diagnosed with cancer shortly after this work came out. And so it's something that we've spoken about an awful lot together. Um, and we're talking about doing a doing a project and photo story about you know, her life and, and, and what she's coped with. And, and I'm going to do it now. Every time I see this photo and uh, wherever it is, I, I take a um, I take a photo of it and uh, I send it to Laurie. And I joke that I should be her agent because I've made her famous. So obviously it's been exhibited all over the place. So, you know, every time I've gone to St. John's College in Oxford or something, I take a photo and I send it to her. But but the best one of this was when the exhibition was at Fujifilm House in Leicester Square. Um, I was walking up so long since i've lived in london i can't remember what it's called but the road that leads into leicester square um and there in a big digital display panel in the window was this photograph of laurie um and so I, I snapped a photo of it and i uh i sent it to her and said look i've put i've put you on a billboard in leicester square so so it for me everything that goes goes along with this photograph just means that it's my uh, it's my favorite of the whole set Call this one Beauty and the Beast. There's Pete on the right just coming in for a shift and Sadie on the left having just come to the end of her shift and she's putting her mascara on before she goes home. I always think Pete looks like a bouncer in this one. And this is the last photo in this set. And, you know, what I've said about senses of humour, you know, there's an incredibly inappropriate sense of humour in theatres. And we were, we were given lots and lots of boxes of... Um, of, uh, of fruit and food and things like that and so of course if you get two two men in their 40s and 30s who obviously are still overgrown schoolboys if you give them a box of fruit and there's bananas and apples in it they're going to do something completely inappropriate with it so that's what's happening here and uh, and there you go so i was very very fortunate that that body of work um did as well for me as it did and I was named Documentary Photographer of the Year in 21 for it. And also I got the um, the FRPS as well, which uh, was nice. And the certificate now hangs proudly in the uh, in the downstairs loo, which doubles up as my dark room. I thought that was, uh, that was a very fitting place to put it. Um, now, I'm quite happy to, to field questions from anyone as we're going along. So does anyone, does anyone want to ask me anything about those before we move on to the... Uh, Onto the next photographs at all because if you do now's the time to do it one of the questions i asked the other day was were your colleagues all the photographs and saw you in the paper were they were they happy for you were they jealous was there any tensions that arose after that 
uh, there was an awful lot of happiness uh, from the younger members of staff who live in an environment where everything they do is put on social media. Um, so, you know, we all, we all, as photographers, you know, most of us, we, you know, we live in an Instagram, Facebook world where every moment of our life is documented. So people being, people seeing themselves in the national press and all over social media and, you know, that was great for some people. There were a couple of people who were pretty reticent about it some of the older members of staff even though they've given me consent to shoot it you know by the time it gets a few a few weeks down the line and they're they're thoroughly peed off with everything that's going on around covid then actually the novelty had worn off and they weren't so happy um particularly members of staff who had elderly parents who had become worried about what their children you know were working with um so yeah, there, there was one guy who also taken some photos in there who, who was a photographer who was not happy that I got the success that I did. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that's by the by. And there's a question from Lorraine, the, yeah. uh, and she's saying, were they mainly grab shots or did you set them up? Was there any... Uh, so most so most of mine were grab shots. Um, there, there, were, there were a couple, you know, a handful that were portraits, um, but they were very much in the minimum. Really, my way of working is to try and take more, more sort of candid stuff as it, as it unfolds. Um, I'm not a massive fan of documentary work where everything is set up as a portrait. Mm. Um, you know, I, I like to portray life unfolding in a more realistic manner, which is, which is why there's an awful lot of humor put into it as well. Um, you know, which is why you've got photos of people playing with apples and bananas and sitting in boxes and, and that sort of thing, because actually that, that was the reality of what, what we were going through. You do, you know, you do have this inappropriate and, uh, and, you know, sort of graveyard sense of humor to get you through things. And that's what, that's what I really wanted to portray in the, in the body of work. And I think that's what made it so successful. It did capture the reality, but in a gentle and, and sensitive way. It, it made it different, didn't it? I think, and, and that was the thing. I didn't, I didn't try to over dramatize it, and that's something that I'm really, really glad that I went down that route. I, I wanted, I wanted to show a more human face, really. Yeah, and Seshi, who works in a hospital, <clears throat> he said that um, he, um, he was a bit. He's a very jealous because. It, but he was very happy for you that you got it rather than a journalist. Rather, so he, he was glad yeah. one, one of the brothers got it rather than one of the yeah, journalists. exactly one for the brotherhood. <laughs> yeah, he was happy with that. Yeah, and then John's asking, did the subjects? Did you get him to sign release forms at the very start of it all? I didn't. Didn't need to. Everyone was absolutely happy. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know what? I, I never use release forms because a lot of the, a lot of the work that I do, it's very obvious that people have given me permission to do it. So we'll we'll go on to the fifty plus project later, but also the next project that I'm going to show you as well. Um, that one I will get a release form because it's it's a pretty sensitive subject matter. Yeah. Um, I, I have never had anyone sign a release form in my life, and it's never come back to uh, to bite me in the ass. I think. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm <clears throat> desperate to see the rest of them because I know that the moving on is yeah because we're the, the, this this stuff has been wonderful, but the moving on stuff is actually it, it is just as good. So crack on, crack on. You're right. Let me minimise that. Okay, so where do you go from when you you know when you, when you've been lucky enough to shoot a project like that, which is uh, you know how do you bounce back from it? And I, you know I was, I was lucky that I was in my fifties, so I kind of took it all with a pinch of salt. I think if I'd been a young photographer in my twenties and I'd managed to sort of shoot the biggest story in the world and put it on newspapers, you know where do you, where do you go after that to trump it? And fortunately, I don't I didn't have to trump it. So how do you keep yourself motivate, motivated? You know, how do you not be defined by one project? I could have, I could have carried on. I could have shot more in, in, in the hospital. Um, and I decided not to do that. And, I, and actually, they, they kind of came a natural end to me shooting because, as I intimated earlier, I got diagnosed with cancer in, in June 2020. So I was in hospital for, for other reasons. Um, so what did I do? So I'd sold a print. I'd sold, I'd sold a, uh, a framed print of Sarah sitting on the stool with the thousand yard stare on to, uh, to a woman who lives in a, in a village locally. And at the time of my diagnosis of cancer, I was, I was taking a lot of photographs in, in graveyards and churchyards because as macabre as that sounds, I found it quite peaceful and cathartic to actually contemplate what was going to happen in my life and what you leave behind when you go. Um, 
and you know, I, I turned out to be very lucky in that my cancer was was a non-invasive bladder cancer, um, but still a really horrible thing to have to go through. And I still go through it now, and still have to have regular checkups. Um, but at the time of my diagnosis, you know, I really didn't know whether I was going to be alive in a year or two years' time. Um, and so I was spending a lot of time sitting in graveyards, taking photos of graves, and I started shooting a project called Once Were Loved, looking at you know what we leave behind in terms of memories and and as we sort of organically sort of disappear back into the earth and and the woman who um i sold the print to wanted to show me the graveyard in in the in the valley's um village that she uh, she lives in and as we were walking back there was uh, this old boy um walking up the street and i thought he'd make a great photo so i asked him if i could photograph him and he went oh he said no i'm, I'm a very private person i don't want my photograph taken um and uh and the woman who um, bought the print said to me, you should photograph Faye. And I went, who's Faye? And she went, come with me, I'll introduce you to Faye. So we went to this house and, and we, uh, we knocked on the door and Faye answered the door. Now Faye is around about the same age as me, a couple of years younger um, and she's transgender. And, um, and she's grown up in the, uh, in the village where where she now lives and she lives in the house that she lived in with her mother and very abusive stepfather from around about 1974 and she's completely eccentric and i just took one look at her and i thought yes this is a great story it's very very you know and looking at what's happening in scotland in the news at the moment you know it's a very very now story you know regardless of which side of the fence you sit on it's a story that kind of defines the times we live in, in, in terms of sort of social acceptance of, of people from this demographic. And, and but she's but Faye's a great character. I mean, and, you know, she does all of the building work on the house herself. She restores old motorbikes. She's got them in the front room. And she makes all of the stuff in the house. She makes all of the, the furniture. She makes she make the stove she cooks on. And I just said to her, I, I, I just took a couple of photos of her and, and it was very obvious that she didn't mind the camera being stuck in her face. And I walked away and I said to Naz, um, who was the woman who bought the, the print, I said, I've got to do a book about Faye. And she went, I'll help you. I'll write it. And I went, no, 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 you won't. I'm doing a book about Faye. And, uh, and so I phoned Faye the next day and said, look, Faye, you don't know me from Adam, but this is what I do. And, you know, I'm a photographer. This is the work I've shot. And I think that you have a story that is worth telling. And the reason I wanted to photograph Faye is because she's the antithesis of 99% of the stuff that you see around transgender issues in the media, which tends to be concentrating on very fashionable, very sort of beautiful or androgynous, you know, fashionably androgynous young people living in metropolitan areas where their lifestyle is very accepted uh, and, and is the norm. And, I, you know, I was quite shocked the other day. I went to Bristol and just how many gender neutral and transgender young people there are now who are, who are, you know, experimenting with gender roles. But Faye doesn't fit that mould. You know, she, she, I won't tell you what she used to be called because she doesn't, like people knowing she she says that she was born in 2014 um but she used to be a jcb driver she's still got six of her own chainsaw she does tree surgery uh you know she can do bricklaying you, you name it um and so i thought there's a really good story here to tell so we're, we're working on in a sort of symbiotic relationship and so you can see that she really kind of doesn't fit the mold at all so here she is in clothes that are covered in sort of building stuff the stove that she's got on the right hand side or and the left as well she actually made herself all the kitchen units she makes so, so she lives in um she lives in you know what looks like absolute chaos because what this story is about is Faye doing up the house herself you know she's doing everything and and it's kind of how because she's so stubbornly doing it herself, she holds the house back. And in some ways, the house holds her back on her journey as well. Because if she was able to just live in a normal up together house and, and not have to worry about getting up every morning and making furniture and plastering walls or whatever, then actually she would probably be further on on her journey. And she's, you know, she's not gone down the surgical route. She's gone down the, 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 the hormonal route, which 
most people do apparently but she but she's been completely open with me and just letting me photograph and, and she's a real character she's uh, she's very interesting but she's she's put her trust in me entirely which is uh, which is a real honor and a privilege um so we'll just flip you through these because i'm aware that i've been talking for a very long time and so here she is in the front room with the motorbikes and and i mean you can see the state of the house it's absolutely covered in cobwebs and uh, what have you with something that she's carved with her chainsaw so Faye is absolutely terrible at answering texts and calls I'm, I'm hoping to go and see her tomorrow um um but i hadn't spoke i hadn't spoken to her for about a month at this point and she hadn't she hadn't answered any texts so i uh, i popped around to um to see her and make sure she was all right basically and I, and I knocked on the door and said hi just checking you're still alive and i said i've not come to take photos i'm just you know making sure you're all right and then she said yeah come and have a cup of tea so i came in i you know had a camera on me i had a, had a little like cl at the time and um and I walked in and as I walked into the kitchen, which is through the door on the left, I looked through and there was a circular saw set up in the front room. I just thought, wow, I said, this is brilliant. So she's now got a, you know, a big cast iron circular saw set up in the front room as well as the motorbikes. And I said, said to her, I said I wasn't here to take photographs, but I am. I said, there's, there's no way I can, uh, I can miss the opportunity to, <coughs> to, to photograph you with your circular saw. And as somebody who spent... 20 years in the antiques trade as an antique restorer i have to say crouching down in the corner of the room uh with no extraction and Faye's incredibly laissez-faire um approach to health and safety was uh not entirely enjoyable but i hope you'll agree it got the shot so uh, we'll turn up at eight o'clock in the morning and she invited me in and she's still getting dressed and uh and so, you know, I've got complete intimate access to um, to so much of what's going on in her life. And I really from from a compositional point of view, the um, the photograph on the left, I just like the way that you've got the the disjointed shadow um, from her foot and and, the, you know, and the shadow coming down to the right hand corner and the shadow from the tights that she's putting on. Um, but also only I will know this, but the book on top of the um, the white unit is actually my book. Um, that I've given her a copy of. Um, so it's, I feel I feel that one's a little bit like Alfred Hitchcock appearing in his own movie. So, and then on the right hand side, you know, because she's obviously going through hormonal changes, she's uh, she's slathering herself in E45 and moisturizer cream all the time. So you can uh, see that. Looking down the landing to to the bathroom and some of her dresses hanging up. So that's the last shot in this little series to show you what I'm doing here. So the beauty of having a project like All in a Day's Work is that suddenly your, your stock and your currency as a photographer rises and, and other people sit up and are interested in, in uh, what you're doing. So I was able to take this project to a, uh, to a publisher and say, look, I'm shooting, shooting this at the moment. What do you think about putting this out as a book? And so, uh, so this is going to come out once I finish shooting this, which should be sometime this year. Um, we're going to bring this this one out as a book. Um, and I, I've said to Faye, you know, I'm going to give you the the, the proceeds from this because I I don't want to be you know making money off you. I don't want this to be seen as a voyeuristic project. You know, I have to I have to be very careful about it because it's not my world. You know, I'm not obviously not trans myself. Uh, I don't want to be seen as as pointing a camera at somebody just to. Um, to make a sort of easy clickbait project, you know, I want to be seen to be doing it for the right reasons. Um, so this is good. Now, one of the other things about this project, and this is this is something I've had to really sort of reflect on my practice. And I've got a very good friend called Abby Trailer Smith, um, who is an incredibly good photojournalist. Um, I think she's one of the best um, in this country. Um, and she worked for the Telegraph, and, and she she does a, a lot of work for for commissioned work now. And she doesn't. I'm trying to get her to mentor me at the moment, and she doesn't like black and white work. And you know, every time I speak to her, she says, "Why don't you shoot this in color? I want to see this in color." And and actually, it's made me really think about this project because one of the things that I absolutely hate in what gets labeled documentary photography and and um 
and reportage photography is is what is often seen as poverty porn uh, you know and, and kind of pointing a camera at things that look as if they're poverty just just for the sake of getting sort of easy likes on social media and, and you know a lot of excuse me a lot of the work that we see around um homeless i think falls into that into that category as well and and so I, I'm, I'm very mindful that i don't want to be seen as going down that route so actually i, I bought myself 10 rolls of kodak color plus the other day first time i bought color film for myself in 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 donkey's years and so i'm going to shoot some of this in color as well because i want to break away from that sort of stereotypical um stereotypical look about this so that's um that's the work i'm doing about fay and so i don't know whether anyone wants to ask me any questions about that i think before we move on to the next uh, next bit there was no questions but that's just somebody that's a bit the mono color thing so yeah you answered that one yeah at the end there yeah to be honest i'm terrified about shooting color because I, <clears> I i see the world in black and white so it's uh yeah. it's gonna be interesting. And, and also i'm surrendering the process to somebody else as well because i don't do color processing so uh everything else i do myself so i'm gonna have to send films off to a lab which is the first time i've done that in donkey's years so you've got a bit of a control freakery about you have you oh, you might yeah. say that i couldn't possibly yeah. comment yeah <laughs> Phase phase project must be quite difficult because it is such a sensitive project, <clears throat> and yeah. she obviously trusts you implicitly yeah. with everything about herself. She she totally. comes across I mean, as, she, she comes can across see how intimate some of the photos person. are. Yeah, it's one I thought I would shoot the um, shoot the project in about a year, but actually uh, I realised that it's more important to do it right than to do it quickly. Yeah. So it's uh, I think we've got another year of shooting on it before I'm I'm happy that I've got what I need. Um, she's, she's obviously an incredible person so that's she that's really good. is i mean they yeah. broke them they broke the mold when they yeah. made Faye. i have to say she's uh she's i've got i've got a photo of her in if you look if you look on the website um it's called one woman's journey and there's a photo of her standing in her garden in a dress a little lace mitts holding a chainsaw <laughs> but that's, that's, uh, yeah no she's she's an interesting character um we'll, we'll look forward to that one coming out thank you Okay. so moving on from there so this this project um is called life goes on so uh, i obviously clinically work with a lot of patients who have got cancer and uh it's just intrigued by how people cope with that level of adversity really so derek who is the chap on the left hand side um who um i know or i knew from abergavenny market i used to see him on a wednesday at um at the antiques and bric-a-brac market because he used to be he used to buy and sell jewelry and and restore it and he was a guy he was, he was a giant he was about you know six foot five really big guy been born with um congenital club feet so he he, he wore big orthopedic shoes, you know like the proper old-fashioned orthopedic shoes that you don't see so much anymore apart from on the older generation um but you can see from his face he'd had an incredibly disfiguring facial cancer uh, and he had a wound above his ear which was still draining so he had a little tube coming down from his ear um but totally open you know i used to i used to talk to him about it all the time and uh he um you know he said that you know children would cross the street or people would cross the street so as not to um not to have to talk to him which is just incredibly sad but he he had this huge degree of positivity about him and, and when i had um, my cancer diagnosis um he was great to talk to you know he was a, he was a really good um empathetic sharer of of knowledge and wisdom as well but he sadly um sadly died about a year ago um and uh he he got an infection or the cancer came back and then he got an infection and and what appeared to be uh you know was going to be sort of two to three years turned into two to three months and he went very quickly so that was you know was a, a sad loss Mike on the right hand side is a guy with prostate cancer so I, I put something on social media saying I was looking for people who were living with cancer but didn't want to be defined by a diagnosis and and uh, so I photographed Mike in his downstairs toilet because he's a like like me he is a um, a complete muso music obsessive and he's got lots of album covers on his um on his on his wall so I thought that I thought photographing him in the loo would be a great place and he actually lives in a house called Astral Weeks which is the the Van Morrison uh, record on the wall just above his shoulder so, that, so this so this project here so this is quite an interesting one so i i studied blogging about my cancer and cancer research wales um saw my blog 
got in touch with me and said, can we, can we um, publish some of it? And I said, yeah, absolutely, sure. And I said, you know, I'm a photographer. I've been working on this project. Um, why don't we do something similar along those lines? So we started working on a project together whereby I'm, I'm actually photographing people in colour um, and digitally for, for this. But every time I photograph them, I, uh, I, I do some of my own work as well for my own project on it. Um, and this woman here is, is called Mary. She, I met her actually when I was commissioned by the British Medical Association to photograph female doctors in, in Wales. And, uh, and looking at the adversities they'd overcome in their career, whether it's just because they're a woman in what was traditionally a very sort of uh, male centric role um, or other adversities. And, and Mary had lost a, a leg to a, ver to a cancer when she was in her teens, when she was a, was a med student, in fact. And she's here trained. So this is Keeper's Pond. This is a this is an industrial pond from the iron um, smelting days up on top of a mountain in South Wales. And she's training for a, uh, a cold water um, swim, very, very long swim. She went off like a torpedo. I mean, absolutely incredible how she could swim with one leg. Um, so this project here, now this this is Naomi, who basically made me feel like my lungs were coming out of my chest because she wanted to be photographed walking up a mountain and she she'd had breast cancer. So this project has come to a kind of a bit of a halt because there's been a change of of management in the charity and and everything's become slightly slower. But out of this project. Um, Jude Rogers, who is the journalist who works for The Guardian and, and The Observer, contacted me to ask me if I wanted to pitch for a job documenting a cancer hospital in, in Wales, which is moving premises in two years time. Um, so we've just won a commission um, to do that. So we actually start that uh, next week. Um, so for two, two, two to three years, we're going to photograph and, and write about the, um, the project. So that's, so that's come out of, uh, out of that. And I'm a, I'm a real believer that whatever happens to you in life is an opportunity and for me cancer has probably given me more than it's taken away from me um you know i i've, I've really kind of been able to pick up the ball and, and run with it and 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 i've been able to use my experience to reach out to other people and write about it and take photos and to help other people going through through that process as well but as a photographer it's given me an awful lot because it's given me access to incredible people to photograph um, and of course, this big this big commission at Valindra as well. So, what do we got after this? So, this is Richard. Richard is um, Richard is a is a friend who who lives in the town. Who's an incredible luthier guitar maker. Uh, here he is restoring a Victorian guitar, and he had leukemia um, about seventeen years ago. So he was he was photographed for the project as well. Um, this was a really really good shoot because I went in to take photos and I came out with a double bass. Um, I used to play double bass. I was saying to Ken and, and Steve earlier, you, you know, when I was in my teens, I used to play and, and I had enough head over quiff. I used to play slap bass in a rockabilly band. So now I'm a big, big jazz fan and, and wanted to get back into playing double bass again. And as I was photographing him, I noticed that he had a really dusty old double bass in, in the corner of the room. And I said, whose is that? And he went, it's my sister's. It hasn't moved for 20 years. Do you want it? So he's given it to me. I've, I've got it on kind of lifetime loan. So, so that was quite a good photo shoot, really. I can't say my other half was overly pleased when I came home with a double bass, but there you go. So, next project. And I guess now we'll, we'll, we'll push on and people can ask me questions at the end. Um, so, House is Not a Home. Now, House is Not a Home is a, is a song by um, Dusty Springfield. Um, a lot of my work, I take it, titles from, from, from songs or song lyrics, they kind of inspire me to shoot. So th this is a project which is looking at the decline of traditional farming in, in, in Wales. And this, this is a house which um, is about five miles from where I live. Uh, and it hasn't been lived in for about 20 years. The, the woman who lived in it was a widow. Um, and then she died and then vandals burnt the house down. And I thought this would just be a really interesting project to photograph this house over the course of four seasons and how it changes over the seasons and how plants move into it and, you know, grow through the roof and through the walls and how local children come in and vandalise it. And, um, and so you can see from the inside, you know, every time I go back in, I, I, I go there once every couple of weeks. And, you know, when I first started going, the, the big oak beam that's diagonally across the floor was actually up parallel to the other beam. Um, you know, the paint's peeling off it. It's just it's, it's just a really, you know, for a black and white photographer, it's a very sort of interesting textural environment. 
and I'm hoping to put this out as a book. Um, and I'm going to have, um, it's going to be split into the four seasons. And at the beginning of each season, it's going to be a poem by a guy called Tim Strang, who is also a photographer, but he's a Welsh hill farmer up in up in mid Wales. And he's a very, very good poet. So we're going to do that. And then I'm going to have, um, hopefully he will write the essay, but I'll find somebody to write an essay about the decline of um, the way of life in, in, in Wales and traditional farming. I mean, one time recently I went, there was... Um, some kids have been in they'd obviously they had a fire they've been burning books in there to keep themselves warm it stands stands right on the banks of the um the river usk so it's, it's, in, a, it's in a lovely place and one time recently i went in and and Local kids had um, had obviously cleaned up the garage and they built a little bench in the corner to sit on, and and then other people have been in. I noticed, you know, there there was sort of you know dope smoking paraphernalia and what looked like a crack pipe in there. So it gets used for all sorts of nefarious reasons. I might, I'm hoping tomorrow that we're going to get snow because I really want some snow for the the project. This is the project I was saying, Steve, that I want some snow for. So I need to I need to uh, go down tomorrow if we get some snow. So the other interesting thing about this project, and you know, the fact that it's called a house is not a home. Last time I was down there, so this is this is a house that was in a little hamlet of, of three houses. And this guy who lived in one of the other houses stopped me and asked me what I was doing. And I told him, and he went, How much do you know about this this little group of houses? And I went, Nothing at all, really. Um, you know, I'm I'm just kind of here initially from an aesthetic perspective. And he said, Do you know about the Profumo affair? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. This is the house that Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis hid away in when they escaped London to get away from the glare of the media during the Profumo affair. And kind of, I just suddenly thought there's a real sort of serendipity about that because the project is called A House Is Not A Home, which was the name I had um, settled on originally, which of course is Dusty Springfield, who is very, very, you know, typical and indicative of that time. But Dusty Springfield also wrote the title track and did a lot of the, the songs for the film Scandal in, in the late 80s, early 90s, which was about the Profumo affair. So there was, there was a, a nice little bit of sort of connectivity about that, I thought. And some obscene graffiti. There you go. So I'm 55. Five years ago, I started shooting a project called 50 Plus, looking at um, looking at who my generation of men are and and uh, and, you know, how we differ from our father's generation. You know, we kind of I say we're almost like the first generation that hasn't had to grow up, you know, because we're not immediately post-war. We didn't sort of go through that sort of hardship of post-war. So, you know, and teenage tribal fashion really sort of kicked in you know from the, the end of the 50s and, and the 60s with teddy boys and the mods and the rockers and then and then skinheads and punks and so it's not unusual now to walk down the street and see guys who are you know like me in in their mid 50s who was a mod at the end of the 70s or a bit older who were punks in the 70s or the hippies or, or skinheads and see them still clinging on to elements of tribal fashion that they had when they were in their teens which is something that my dad's generation really didn't didn't do or it was very very rare if they did i mean my son is 20 my oldest son is 21 and he'll borrow my clothes but there's no way that I would have borrowed my dad's clothes when I was I was 21 and so I'm just photographing photographing um guys of my sort of age and and 20 years above and looking at who we are as a as a, as a demographic um so the, the guy on the left is a guy called Grant Marshall who um is one of the the members of the the, the Bristol band Massive Attack um chap on the right Alistair um I bizarrely met in a lingerie shop in um in Monmouth when I was walking past and he was standing in the door should have got a photograph of him standing next to incredibly buxom uh, mannequins with with lingerie on as he was in the door but I thought no, I'll photograph him for this and so he's um he is you know the sort of archetypal reason why you should never judge a book by its cover really I mean he's absolutely covered in tattoos uh I've seen him recently he's even more tattooed now than um than he uh than he was there but he's he's about 75 i think um and he's public school educated uh incredibly articulate very well spoken um and he's a classical professional classical musician amazing pianist um but yeah just just a really really sort of interesting character 
this is a guy that I photographed um, in town recently uh, in a pink Hawaiian shirt. This is a guy called Julian Riot, who is a, a music promoter in um, in uh, Newport in South Wales, who this was at the opening of a photographic gallery, actually, in Newport. And uh, the reason he's leaning slightly to the left is because if that door frame hadn't been there, he would have fallen over. I think he's that drunk. Um, I'll leave you to work out what his politics are. And this is a guy who used to be a professional photographer who I bumped into uh, in the street one day and or as I was out for a walk, I was I was testing some new film, actually, I was I got hold of a film called Exeter Pan, um, which I think is old Ilford um, surveillance film. And I was I was writing a piece for um, Silver Grain Classics magazine about it. And I was just out testing the role. And he he came past and uh, photographed him and had a, had a chat to him. And uh, so that's the last one in this series. And then we'll just sort of go on to the, the last few. So just just kind of I think it's really important. I mean, I I, I, I always shoot projects. But I, but I allow myself to experiment. I, I do something cool. If you look at my website, there's something called On My Walkabouts, um, which is where, you know, I just kind of go walk about and, I, and I, I practice on photographing different things and look for inspiration. And mannequins, I always find, you know, from a sculptural perspective, they're really interesting because, you know, they're obviously modelled on the human form, but there's something very eerie about them. Um, I think you know it comes comes as anyone who was a child in the 1970s will remember the um, the mannequins in Doctor Who and how sinister they were with the guns in their hands, or almost more sinister than the Daleks. And so, but but also, I think there's a really sort of interesting sort of sociological um, and anthropological um, element about mannequins because they they tend to be sculpted and modelled on the top models of the day. So. They, they start off their life in couture and, you know, they'll work their way down as, because they're very expensive. So, you know, but then they go out of fashion and they get sold to smaller shops. And then you go to junkyards and reclamation yards and you, there's tons and tons of mannequins. And it's almost, it's kind of an interesting story about how society treats the female form, almost as if, you know, a body shape is in fashion. So in the 60s, you know, Twiggy was in fashion and and then models became more buxom and then they got thin again. And, and so it's... It, in some ways, I think it, they kind of reflect the way society treats women and actually now treats men as well. You know, men have become much more aware of, you know, their physicality and having their, having their sort of photos taken in the street, particularly young men as well, because they're only now beginning to see the same sort of levels of scrutiny that women have seen from from media pressure in terms of their style and their physicality. So I think I think there's quite an interesting story in mannequins. Um, the one on the left, I wish I'd bought and just stuck it in the end of the garden. Um, I just really like the fact that there were two of them and then somebody chose, somebody bought one of them and then her her worth has decreased um, down to £50 and then £30 because for some reason she suddenly lost a finger. So uh, I think that's quite a nice story in that one. And then this is the last one. And this, this was in a charity shop uh, in Monmouth and it just reminds me of... I like the way that the... Uh, the arms are uh, are echoed, um, but also, and I like the way that one is naked and the other one's got the little black dress on. It just reminds me of Audrey Hepburn in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, this one, and that I think, if my memory serves me well, is it. And that's me, and that's what I do. And thank you for listening. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. You're welcome. The um... Great value for money again. That's twice I've sat listening to that. Well, there you go. Times. <laughs> and and uh, it was well worth listening to again. So <clears throat> what, what I think from an RPS point of view, working in working in projects all the time, that that chimes well with the RPS stuff. But <clears throat> you work, you you've had cancer, you've got kids, you've got a partner, um you're a busy, busy person. You're writing so, for this magazine, you're writing for Silver Effect, you're writing... You so know, I, would, I, you I, I always joke that, I, I joke that there's an element of ADHD um, about me. And and my my friend who I mentioned earlier, who's the photographer, um, Abby Trailer-Smith, um, I, I was talking to her about this the other day and uh, and because she has a personal, you know, for her family, she has a personal interest in that. And, and I said to her, I said, oh, I'm sure I've got an element of ADHD about me. And she went, oh, for God's sake, don't be so stupid. She goes, you're about as ADHD as it comes. 
And I'd never really thought about it before. And I think it's really interesting. I, I'd always sort of assumed that my brother is slightly on the spectrum. And, uh, but not you. But exactly, exactly. So, but then you realise that the spectrum is bloody huge, isn't it? And, uh, and I was at my parents down in Devon a while ago, and and you know my mum was there and my dad was there, and uh, we were talking about Laurie, my brother, who's a professional musician. And I went, oh, Laurie's definitely on the spectrum. She went, oh, for goodness sake. She said, all three of you are on the spectrum. And so I think actually, you know, there probably is an element of of that about me. I do. I'm a bit, I would joke that I'm a bit like Tigger. I'm always kind of bouncing around. <clears throat> um, and I said it, I said it the other day, you know, when I wasn't, I wasn't painfully shy as a kid, but I was like most teenagers, I was, I was very awkward and I wasn't particularly confident about myself. And I had a lot of friends who were supremely confident and came from quite affluent backgrounds. And it was very easy to be kind of overshadowed by them. And, and, and when I started photography, the camera was great because it was something that I could hide behind. And all the time I was doing this, nobody could see me and I could look at the world on my own terms. And so I used the camera as a tool to hide myself from the world in a way and to put that barrier between me. Whereas now I'm in my 50s and I've got confidence and I'm a real people person and my photography is all driven by, by people. I like photographing people. This is no longer a wall this is a device that helps me go out and meet people. And that's why I do so much. But yeah, I, I, I'm a fidget. I, I like to be doing lots of things. So the, the camera has gone from being a, from being a wall to a bridge really, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. So seeing as asking, you were still working. I know you're still working. Yeah. So do you see photography almost as a second job or do you still see it? Yeah, as yeah, a I, see it I see it as parallel careers, really. Parallel I, de career. I, I define myself as a photographer who just happens to do something else to... Uh, as well as. Yeah, to feed the cats, you know, that's it, that sort of thing. So. And then Lorraine's asking about getting books printed. D did you fund your own initially, obviously? The, the... No, I was very lucky. So, um, so Static Age Zines, who had, um, you know, a good track record of putting, putting out zines and smaller photo books... Um, actually put the first book out but i had I, so i was originally i was i was on a podcast um three years ago i was on it with my son actually a sort of father and son film photographer a podcast all about film photography and pete Folkers, who runs static Zines, was on it as well we did one together and i said to him um i said look do you want to put some of my work out and he went he said yeah at some point i will i'd like to but you know i'm, I'm booked up for a good two years like most publishers are and then covid came along and he got in touch with me and said have you got any photos that you could put out as a zine and i went yeah i've got photos and he went how many could you let me have you've got about 20 oh well i've got about 100 so far that i'd be happy to publish and he went okay let's do a book um i said okay fine he said we can give the profits to, you know to the nhs that'll be a really good gesture and i said no i said it'll be a drop of water in a bucket i said it, it, there's no point i said let's give the projects to mental health um charity because that's going to be what really needs funding after this there's going to be such a huge mental health fallout so we did that and i sent him i sent him all the um, i sent him the essay i'd written um and then i sent him the photos through on a tuesday night uh, or tuesday evening and he said, give me till the end of the week and I'll see if I can come up with something. So I'd, so I'd written this and, and I'd written a, a conclusion to it. And uh, Owen Shears, who is a Welsh novelist and poet, um, who wrote the play to provide all people to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the um, of the NHS. Uh, I shot his author photographs for him a couple of years ago. So I got in touch with him and said, do you fancy writing a foreword for this book for me? <clears throat> and he said, yes. And I had to chase him right, you know, right down to like five minutes before we went to press um for him to get it to me and by so i sent this stuff off to pete on tuesday evening and by tuesday night i think at about one o'clock in the morning you know i my email pinged and pete had sent me through the first proof of the book and i just looked at it and thought wow this is amazing and so within two weeks we had gone to press uh and we sold out three editions i think we sold a thousand copies in 36 hours or something like that. <clears throat> you'll, be, you'll be glad to know that he did phone me and uh, the next print the next pub lot are out in march so brilliant so we're yeah. doing we're doing a hardback version now which yeah. if anyone wants a hardback version you get in touch with static age zines you might be able to buy one off him he had he, he pulled it because he had real problem problem with the printers um but there will be issues well it's a hardback copy i've got coming so right so I mean, if, if anyone... he says it's june march 
Yeah, if I can, if I can be really mercenary here as well and cheeky, it's very, very difficult. I mean, I'm lucky I earn a wage, but it's very, very difficult to fund the type of long-term projects that I do without actually selling work as well. I've got so I was I was the um, one of the photographers at, um, at Photo North. I've got. 14 no 13 now a2 size prints from this um the covid series uh that i'm selling they'd normally be 275 but i'm selling them for 100 pounds each to uh to fund my next exhibition which is uh going to be in april so if anyone wants if anyone wants to know what they are they can get in contact with me and i'll show them the prints i've got but, uh, and that's there's the address right below you yeah exactly you've got my you've got my email address have a look have a look at the website and i'll uh, i'll tell you which ones i've got grand right well it's been a good old night. The um, thank you very much for your time. The um, like to thank everybody else for coming along as well. The um, well, the next one is ooh, the next one is Bella Kotek, who is a fantasy photographer. So we've had we've had the gritty reality of of David and and his non-existent quiff, and we're moving on to Bella Kotek, who yeah, that's the one. And Bella, 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 Bella could make you a quiff. She, she? Does, she mainly does women. She she. Um, she empowers females and she's we live in gender fluid times yes. i'll swap her a quiff for a print I'll, I'll put that to her i'll put that to her so <laughs> you'll all get emails about that this talk has been recorded so it's going to be uh, on our youtube page fairly shortly but tomorrow or the day after whenever we get it all down and sorted and i'd just like to thank david again for giving his time so generously and showing us his wonderful work and a lot more to them than just the, the covid stuff and you've shown that tonight and we're we're really delighted and very pleased to be able to see that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone, for coming along. Makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. Cheers.